This is the Dental Up Podcast, your daily source for insights from dentists and leaders in the industry. Brought to you by Keating Dental Lab, a full-service, award-winning dental lab that is here to add value to your dental practice. With high-quality restorations, friendly, reliable service, the best products, and prices, come experience the Keating difference. Visit KeatingDentalLab.com for details. Welcome back to the Dental Lab Podcast. I'm your host, Bob Brandon, the General Manager here at Keating Dental Lab. First, let me say congratulations to the University of South Carolina women's basketball team, led by Coach Don Staley, on their epic win last night versus UConn in the Women's National Championship game. Congratulations. What a great season you've had. On our last episode, you heard one of our newer clients, Dr. Eric Wienstra, describe how he found Keating and what it's like to work with us. At one point in our conversation, I mentioned that we purposely built several parameters into our business model that lead to successful long-term relationships with clients. You know, Keating Dental Lab is closing in on 20 years in business, and we've had many people work here to help us achieve this success. But it always starts at the top. The lab owners, Sean and Shannon Keating, are here every single day, and they treat each employee as though we're a member of their own family. All of us employees, in turn, aim to treat all of our customers as though we're all family. And I don't mean those families that used to show up on the Jerry Springer show. I'm not sure if there's a good modern day example of that show, but I mean the type of family that's there to support and help each other. And that's what Keating is. And a company's greatest asset is its people, especially a dental lab, especially a service industry. It takes so many talented, smart, and dedicated people to make it run efficiently. So today, you're going to hear the story of one of our longest tenured employees our senior technician, our removable department manager, and a man I've been fortunate to know and work with for nearly 20 years, Mr. Jim McEcker. Jim, good morning. Welcome to the Dental Up podcast. You've had a remarkable career as a dental technician. And if I've got my math right, is is it 57 years? Exactly. 57. That is truly amazing. How did you get started in this field? Well, it was really interesting back in uh, 1965 when I graduated from high school, I really wanted to be a dentist. So I applied to UCLA and it was a little late. So they recommended that I go on to actually a pilot program that they started at LA City College as a dental technician. They said that it would be beneficial for me later. So I went ahead and I applied, got into school and went through their pilot program for one year. And then at that time, at the end of that year, during the period of 1966, so when Vietnam was really starting uh, to ramp up and I got my draft notice. So, oh, so I just thought, well, uh, I'm being trained as a dental technician from the Navy dental technician manual. So I, I looked into going into the Navy and continuing my education so L.A. City College was using the Navy manual? Yes, it was at that time. Fantastic. Yeah, at wow. that time. So I went into the Navy as actually a hospital corpsman. And they didn't tell mm-hmm. me that. But anyway, I went in there and I applied for the dental technician school. And of course, having some background in it, it was just a, an easy fit for me and of course, for them as well. So um, I went in as a dental technician. And what they don't tell you is you're not really a true dental technician fabricating uh, removable and fixed prostheses. You go in as a dental assistant. Yeah, you're a corpsman. Yes, exactly. So I was a dental assistant. I went through the dental technician A school. That's what they call it. And then when I graduated A school, you could apply if your grade point average was high enough. And and, uh, I applied for C school, which was the next school. And that was the dental technician prosthetics. And there were 14 of us that applied for the class. And there were only two selected out of the 14. And I was fortunate to be one of them. Wow. So congratulations. Yeah. So I went, I actually went in the, in the military, went two years of schooling, actually learned a lot about dentistry in general. And of course, in the Navy, you're trained to not only do your job chair side, and then of course, in the laboratory, but we had to learn how to repair things because you know, you can't call SS White or any of the other repair facilities. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you're you're on your own when you're in the middle of the ocean. That's right. When you're out to sea for 30 days and and something breaks down, you have to uh, learn how to repair it or at least know how to repair it. So anyway, that so that that's kind of how it, it all started off. We started in the military and it was really good. 
going to school in the military, you're taught the initial basically prosthetics are setting up dentures, partial dentures. As a junior technician, that's what you start off as. You you set teeth, uh, you learn to wax, cast, finish partials. And on um, the ships that I was on, it had all the all the necessary equipment to perform the task. So it, it was it was well worth uh, my my time that I spent there. I, you know, in the very beginning, when you're young, you think, oh, my God, four years is a long time. But it, it passed by really, really quickly. I spent the time that I spent I had was on three ships. The first one I came from California right to uh, Newport, Rhode Island on a destroyer tender, uh, USS Arcadia, which was AD 23. And it was interesting for me because here I am coming from a nice, warm Southern California coast here to uh, in January. And when I reported on board, uh, the bay was frozen over. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So it was extremely cold and a, and a rude awakening for me. But I was on the Arcadia for uh, six months and then they issued me new orders. And I went to the USS Intrepid, uh, CBA 11, which was an aircraft carrier. And I was yeah. stationed on that. Still in, still in commission, I believe. Yeah. Well, actually, it's it's now a, a museum in New York. And oh, okay. It's, uh, oh, that's right. It's, yeah. it's uh, moored in, in New York. And they didn't decommission it. They just, you know, basically they wanted to save it. So they, they made a museum out of it. So it was on the Intrepid for uh, a little over a year. And we had orders to go to the Gulf of Tonkin. Of course, that was a, a war zone. And my brother, my older brother, was in the army and he was in Da Nang. So you can't have two brothers in a war zone right. at the same time because of the Sullivan Act. Uh, yep. And um, so they transferred me within 12 hours of deployment. And I went from the Intrepid right across the dock to the USS Forrestal, which was uh, CVA 59. And that's where I remained for the remainder of my enlistment. And uh, we had Tyconium casting machine on board that that boat. And there were six operatories and there were two dental technicians in the, in the department, myself and a, a chief petty officer. Wow, that is that's fantastic. So four four years in the Navy, three ships and. How many? So, how many ports did you get a visit, and well, which was your favorite one? But remember, this is a family show, so yeah. <laughs> I don't want I don't want you to get in trouble with your wife. No, no. Actually, um, because I was transferred from the Intrepid to the Forestall, the Forestall, of course, was on the East Coast, and we had I had a tour, had to get that two tours back to back, nine months each in the Mediterranean. Okay. So I I. Actually, all the port port of calls were there was uh, Marseille in France and there was uh, Italy. We had Naples and we had Greece, Athens, Salonika, uh, up into the Adriatic, which was up uh, along the coast of Italy to Trieste, Trieste, Italy, which is was one of my favorite ports because it was just a quiet little town and. And it was just serene. It was beautiful. It, it really was. And actually, I, met, and I actually met a girl there, too, which was really interesting, an Italian girl. <laughs> but uh, I, I won't go into It's nearly a war zone these days. Yeah. So anyway, but uh, I think Trieste was probably my the best port of call. I also enjoyed Athens a lot because of the history and the Parthenon and the Acropolis and, and the people itself. Uh, they were just really back then. Uh, of course, it's all changed now, but. I really enjoyed it. the time that I spent in the military. I took advantage of it. I, I never consumed alcohol, believe it or not, the whole time I was in the Navy. And sailors have a bad reputation of going going into town and drinking it up, partying. But my parents never drank. I never drank and never thought about it. So uh, I took advantage of all the tours and uh, the opportunities that the Navy provided. So uh, for me, the military was good. I learned to ski in Andorra, which is a principality in Spain. I learned to scuba dive in Athens. Uh, there was a military installation there and they have a dive instructor, took advantage of that. So actually it was just like a uh, ongoing vacation for me. And then of course, uh, and I learned a lot, met a lot of uh, really wonderful people. And, and for a young man, any at that age, I, I was exposed to life at its fullest, I guess you might say. 
Oh, that, that, that sounds fantastic. I mean, that's, you know, the, the military, United States military gave you an education. They allowed you to, to see the world and, and gain a lot of, you know, really valuable and fun life experiences and, and molded you into the man you are today. I mean, I, I, I remember you and I used to work side by side down on the first floor here, and you used to always preach accountability. We have to be accountable. And I know that that comes from your military background. Exactly. I think that's that's something that it's kind of, I won't say gone by the wayside there, but people aren't held accountable like they used to be. Well, we do here. And that and that comes straight from you. And I appreciate that. Well, yeah, I, th- I just think that things obviously have changed over the years. And and I have some definite opinions, <laughs> but I keep those to myself. But uh, anyway, I, I do what I do because I love doing it. I enjoy being a lab technician. I enjoy the interactions with our clients that we have, the young ones that are out of school to, from what I understand, don't get the, the full advantage or, and it is an advantage to learn how to do what we do. They, they can send the work out to laboratories and they get the work back and and they put it in the mouth, but they really don't know how to fabricate the product. And the doctors that I initially worked with for years could actually teach me how to do the things that I'm doing. And now it's just the reverse where I'm talking to doctors and helping them through the difficult cases. And well, yeah, I mean, we 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 problem solve here. And that's, exactly. You know, that's our job. And you know, that, that goes back to the relationship we have the, with the customers. We have to understand the the level, the education level, the technical level that they're at in order to to problem solve and and to you know figure things out for them. And that's that's ninety nine percent of our job here. Exactly. But let's let's go back. So so you got out of the Navy and then you came back home to California. What did you do? What what did you do next? All right. So in nineteen seventy, uh, June of nineteen seventy, I received my honorable discharge, and of course, I came home right away. My dad was a, a graduate of uh, MIT, and he was quite a disciplinarian too, as well. And it was like go to work right away. So I I looked around. I actually worked a, in a Crown and Bridge lab in the mornings, and a, a removable lab in the afternoons. So I, I worked two jobs, and then I always wanted to do ceramics, and that was the premier position at that time was to be a ceramist. So I actually uh, went and found a a school to teach me how to do ceramics basics. And I took the class, went through it, and I actually was employed by a a doctor who had a small lab. And the first thing I was doing there was just his regular Crown of Bridge bowl work. And then I started doing his ceramics. So I worked there for, for quite a while. And then after that, I worked in a laboratory with another gentleman who was a really wonderful technician. He learned from uh, Dr. Hollenbeck in Long Beach. Um, Mm. And uh, I mentored under him for quite a while. And then I was kind of bored and I wanted to move on, move forward. So I was fortunate enough to to get a position with Dr. Niles Guichet, who in Orange, and I didn't know at that time who Dr. Niles was, and I was managing his in-house laboratory. Uh, I worked there for 11 years, but uh, that was probably the highlight of my career because uh, the man was just a fantastic mentor. He was a genius, and I think he instilled in me the passion that I have for dentistry. Yeah, I mean, he he truly is one of the giants of of prosthodontics. I mean, his his office, Providence Prosthodontics, has been here in Southern California forever. And Dr. Niles actually invented the Danar articulator, and it's you know, I, I know he recently passed, and it's it's the dental community lost a lost a giant, and his two sons are now carrying the torch for him. Right, Bag, uh, Niles actually invented that in 1963. It was the D four. Everything that I worked on when I was working with Dr. Niles was the D5A, which is a fully adjustable instrument. And uh, it was programmed pneumatically by a controlled pantograph. It was fully adjustable instrument. And it used at that time, it was state of the art, interchangeable condyle guidances. So um, and at that time, I didn't know anything about what he was talking to me about. And I learned quite a bit about it. Of course, everything we do in our industry is about occlusion. So I really learned 
about occlusion and how things work. Fortunate enough, he had a, a program called NGA Seminars that he had up in Vancouver for a oh, three-year program. And I was fortunate enough to travel with him and actually work with him side by side up in Vancouver. And we'd go fly every, every other month and we'd take all the instrumentation. And we had a 10 to 12 dentist up there that was taking his course. And I really got to know the man and he was a genius. Yeah. And it's so sad he's no longer with us, but his, his work lives on and, and his legacy will continue on for sure. Absolutely. So, um, you know, this, this goes back a number of years, but I, I remember a day <laughs> we were both on the first floor here and I don't even know if we had much of the second floor at that time, but do you remember when Sean called us into his office and said, Hey guys, we're, we're going to be full service. We're going to start a <laughs> removable lab and, and Ron Baggett's going to head it up. And I mean, I, I was, I was a little bit in shock then, but man, we've, We've come a long way since that time. Can you remember, tell us about the, the early days of our removable team? Yeah, the removable department, it was always something that, that uh, as a lab person or lab tech, always thought if, you know, if I were going to have a laboratory, I would want it to be full service um, sure. and make it convenient for the doctors. Doctors are busy enough at the chair running their practice, and they don't need to have a half a dozen labs, uh, you know, sending work to one crown and bridge lab and removable to another lab, maybe orthodontics to another lab. You know, it's just, it's just a little bit more for them to have to handle. So when Sean called us in, I thought that was a, a really a good idea. Never be, never thinking that I would end up here uh, running the department. Uh, because I, I remember thinking it was a good idea, but I, I was more focused on the, the execution of it, how we were actually going to pull it off. Yeah. And, and Ron and, Ron did a great job in initiating it and starting it up. And then after after Ron left, Jim Kane took over and who came from another laboratory with a lot of experience in, in yep. removable. And now and now Jim is living every every technician's dream. He, he, he retired from the bench and is in Tennessee making bourbon. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Which is really interesting. You know, uh, I, 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 he loves his job. He actually well, started. What's not to love about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I found really interesting was when I visited him, he told me that he started off as a docent, just taking people around and talking about the bourbon and whatnot. And then he then he got involved in in uh, actually making the bourbon at this company. But um, his boss told him, OK, if you have a client that is interested in purchasing a uh, quite a bit of bourbon, then you can sit down and drink with him. So I just thought, wow, what a job. You know, you can drink on the job, get paid for it and and, and have a passion for what you do is great. So I don't think Cal OSHA uh, allows that here. No, not at all. Not at all. So Jim, Jim is, uh, you know, he's doing really well. Now he's into, he's not actually, he's working at the company, but he's actually now distilling the, the whiskey and, and uh, he loves it. And I can't imagine after being at the bench for so many years and then trying something new like that and the way it started off is, is pretty interesting. But anyway, he did really well here. He, he got us off the ground and, and moving forward. And, and then when he was ready to leave, Sean called me in the office and said, he goes, hey, dude, he goes, do you know, remember how to do removables? And I go, well, yeah, Sean, I did it 40 years in the Navy, uh, 40 years ago in the Navy. And I, I'm pretty sure I could just matter of getting caught up on some of the attachments and stuff that go with the partials. And, and he goes, well, I want to put you up there uh, just for a few months until I get a, a manager. He said, then, then I'll bring you back down on the floor and you can go back to doing what you were doing. So I said, OK, well, I think that was like eight maybe I was gonna 10 say. years ago. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a long time. So, but since then we've grown the department and I, we have uh, 12 technicians here now that do really well and they know what they're doing. They're trained. And, you know, and I got to say, you've really molded them into a, a nice cohesive team where it is, it is a lot like, you know, on the first floor of the crown and bridge where, you know, you've got, You've got your go-to guys for each procedure and 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 each you know product really, and it's 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 really nice. And I congratulate you on on getting this uh, group of guys 
really molded in your image? Well, you know, it, it is about teamwork. And I, I keep telling them up here, you know, I'm trying to, to engage them in, in making their own decisions instead of it seems like every morning when I when I come in, there's always a line standing here at my my door waiting for questions and, you know, answers and this and that. And I, I always tell them, you guys, come on, think about this. I said, because one of these days, I'm not going to be here. You know, I'm going to have my 75th birthday in July. So, you know, I, 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 just, I, again, as long as I have my health, I'm going to stay with it. Age is just a number to me. Doesn't mean anything necessarily, but I'm sure there's going to be a time when, when I'm just going to have to walk away, but I'm trying to engage my people here to make their decisions on their own, teach them to think outside the box. You know, I, it is, like you said, initially, it is about teamwork and I have a wonderful group of people up here that I work with. So it's extremely enjoyable. Yeah. Well, and that, and that's good preparation. I mean, you, you have your health, your, your mind is as sharp as ever. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I pray to God I'm, I'm in your shape when I'm nearing 75, <laughs> but I don't think I will be, but you know, that that'll come later on, but yeah, you know, it's, you've got a great group, a great team and, you know, just foster a little bit more, you know, decision-making good decision-making on their part. And, and I know we're going to be, I know we're going to be just fine, but Hey, I mean, you've, you've had an unbelievable career. I mean, we've seen a lot of materials come and go over the past 30 years. You know, you've had the Inseram brand then Wool Ceram and Empress 2 and Cap Tech. And, and now we're in this age of Zirconia and more specifically CAD CAM. So tell us about the CAD CAM advances in the removable field and tell us how Keating does digital dentures. Okay. Well, it's really just started this past year, maybe two years ago, where digital dentures and the digital world has finally got into removable. Four years ago, I went to Atlanta for Denture Symposium. It was a three-day symposium. And that's where I was introduced to it. That's when it was just starting off. And they had a lot of wonderful speakers, uh, professors and whatnot, and they did a fantastic job in promoting it. At that time, Dent Supply was launching its new resin that they have. It's got a 1200 megapascal, which is like zirconia, and it's uh, it uses IPN teeth, which is one of the best denture denture tooth or teeth denture teeth, I should say, in in the industry. It's uh, multi layered. It's got great aesthetics. So with a combination of of a high strength acrylic and um, high aesthetic looking denture tooth. It has a, a really, it's, it's a great product. The fits are phenomenal. The scans can be done intraoral, or you could do it, you know, as we call it now, the old analog way of just taking a regular impression. Um, they also have something that you can take a vertical registration uh, much easier than doing base plates and bite rims. And yeah, so t tell us about that, because that's, I mean, really, that's one of the keys is recording vertical dimension and, you know, how that's done. I mean, just, you know, scanning maxillary and mandibular arches and then, you know, recording the, the vertical dimension. I'm not going to steal any thunder. Tell us what it is and, and, and how you utilize it. Well, it's, it's a, something that uh, Iowa Clark came up with, and it's called a centric tray. And it, it goes back to basic dentistry 101 in taking a vertical registration. It's just a matter of putting a, a dot on the nose and a dot on the chin in the relaxed position and taking that measurement. And then you load the tray up and the tray is, is designed. So if, if you even go further back to taking a centric relation. And you want to have the person close in a, in a repeatable position, you might say. You just have them put their, their tongue to the ball to the palate and, ha and hold it there and then close. And, and it pushes the condyles back further back. And, and it actually, it, it's a repeatable centric. So the device, the centric tray has, they're like not only to hold the putty material in place, but it also forces you to keep the tongue back and out of the way. So they load the material on the tray. And then they, they put it in and they have the patient close and you have either a pair of calipers or you could use dental floss or you can use a tongue blade or anything you want 
and have them close into the two dots are where they're supposed to be. In the relaxed position, you take the measurement first, and then uh, you can do it, like I said, with calipers. You, you put the centric tray in and you have them close until you, those two points are met. And then after that, it sets up, remove it, and send it into the laboratory. So virtually, you can have a scan in the upper arch, scan the mandibular arch, do a centric tray bite, send it into the laboratory. We put it on the computer. We scan it in three shape. Uh, we design it, and we return it to the doctor uh, as a try-in, and it's an acrylic try-in. It's yeah. So so utilizing the centric tray, scanning both arches. How many steps are we cutting out? Oh, it, at least you could if you if you do your protocols right and everything is spot on. You can actually do a denture in two to three appointments and you're eliminating a custom tray. You're eliminating uh, base plates and bite rims. An extra try-in uh, doesn't have to be done. So you're eliminating three appointments, which is, you know, it's time saving. And think and think about that. Exactly. Think about the time savings, the chair time savings, the, you know, the added real, you know, convenience and efficiency to the patient. I mean, that's why scanners and this technology is just so incredible. I mean, yes, there is there is still the physical bite registration, the physical video capture, which is very important. But, man, we've done a number of these three appointment dentures that are very successful. They're very successful and they're very predictable. The fits are even better. There's just it's just gone from from day to night, if you want to call it that, you know, it's just uh, overnight, it's a success. And we're now starting to do uh, partial dentures where we get the models, the casts are in, they're put on the, the scanner, we scan them, and we design them, and then we print them as well. It eliminates a lot of time in the laboratory, but more importantly, the accuracy is is much better. You're not, you know, you have a printed frame and it's a uniform thickness. You don't have bulky castings. It's, it's just better in the long run. We're also doing night guards digitally. We scan them and then we print them. The fits are phenomenal. The accuracy is there. It's, it's just changed everything in the removable department. But the hardest part, I think, is getting the technicians to accept it because dental lab people don't like change. <laughs> Probably no, like a lot of us. <laughs> really? Yeah. Stubborn? No, that's that's no. <laughs> that's not the this, this industry. <laughs> no, I know. And, and so... You know, and, and for me, you know, with all the years that I've been in it, I, I've seen it go from where, where you used to have to wax a crown. Now you you design it, you go to a library, you pick out a number 14, you put it in the place and boom, it's done. And a few changes here and there, modifications, and, and it it's uh, it's all changed. Uh, and the same thing up here in removables, it's similar in the sense that, you know, you go to a library and you select the tooth size and, and you put it on the computer, hit click, and it's boom, done. You don't have to sit in and set every denture tooth. You know, there's 14 on the upper and 14 on the lower, and you got to set them in, and you got to this and that. Uh, with uh, digital, it's it's basically done automatically, point and click, and, and then you have to manipulate a little bit for excursions and stuff like that. But yeah, and that's that's where the skill and and the experience, the judgment comes into place. And not all not all labs, not all technicians have that. But yeah, I always go back to you know the purpose of technology is is opening up you know more more patients to to treatment, and also making us more efficient. You know, we have same number of technicians, but they can process you know more cases each day because of you know the having the technology aid their daily workflow, you know, it's not replacing it. It's just helping them. But yeah, I mean, the, the CAD CAM market was, has, has been unreal for dentistry. I mean, it first went into crown and bridge cause that's obviously the lion's share and right. our, our vendors, you know, focused on, you know, crown, crown and bridge implant materials. But yeah, in the past four to five years, they've really gotten into the removable segment of the market. And I'm, I'm thrilled with the results that you guys are getting. I'm, you know, I hear the feedback from the customers. I hear how happy they are with, you know, decreased uh, appointment times and number of appointments. That makes them more efficient. That that allows them to see more patients and, and open up, you know, more appointments so they can focus on other tasks. And, 
it's it's really really amazing. Any uh, any other removable applications that you see coming down the pike? No, I don't see anything right now. Um, I'm just up here. It's just getting my guys to accept the new technology and and make them understand that it's it's just making their job a little bit easier. It's not as arduous to sit there day after day, hour after hour, and setting teeth and so on and so forth. Uh, it makes it easier for the, the dentist too to to do what he has to do because. I, I think more than one time a day, actually, to be very honest with you, I, I hear over the phone from doctors, I hate doing dentures. I hate doing dentures. <laughs> I don't like it, you know, and this is this is going to change things to where it's just going to be so easy. It, it just and it, it's better for the patient in the long run, too. I think they they end up with a better product. It's becoming more affordable two, four, right. because, Absolutely. you know, in this country, I'm appalled at the fact that we have so many people that are edentulous that just can't afford to have a denture. And they're coming out with now uh, some dentures that maybe are not the high aesthetic quality, you might say, but they're functional. I think that's that should be the primary uh, concern here is function for people that, that, you know, they need teeth. And there are a lot of places in this country, the poor people that just don't have it. And I think digital dentistry is, is going to make it now more affordable. Absolutely. It opens, opens up care to a previously underserved segment of the market. Absolutely. And, and that's, you know, that, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, yeah, people should not be walking around without teeth. And, you know, now that, now that CAD cam you know, the, the CAD CAM procedures and the materials have really caught up and in some aspects surpassed conventional materials. Yeah, I, I, I really see that, you know, there shouldn't be any people walking around te without teeth. You know, there, there are dentists that should be able to, you know, serve this segment of the community and, and get them some teeth. Right, exactly. I mean, it's just going to it's going to make it better all the way around for everybody, not only for the practitioner, but also for the patient and and. That's that's why we do what we do every day. It's not necessarily about making money is is about providing for the people that don't have the means to to even have dentists or teeth, I should say. Right. Affordable dentistry is, is basically what it should be. And, and I, I know over the years when I was doing ceramics, I, I learned that I made a huge impact on people's lives, just personality wise, where people would talk with their hand over their mouth. And when you're done, you know, doing what you do and then they smile and it just makes it, it's life changing. It's just life changing. So I think that's the other reason why I still stay with it is because I, I really uh, see the impact that we do have on, on people in general, I guess you might say. And no, it, it is it's a hundred percent. And that's, that's why we do this. I mean, our, our company tagline previously was creating smiles every day. And I'm going to share one quick story before I let you go. Cause I know it's Monday morning here yeah. and we're all super busy, but so we picked up a new customer from orange just, you know, on Chapman and he said, this was in the height of the pandemic. He sent his patient over, you know, for custom shade taking and because he was getting married in two weeks and he had seven, eight, and nine. And I think one was a, one was a veneer and two crowns or two crown or two veneers and one crowns. I can't remember exactly, but you know, he was, he was so thrilled that he found a dentist to help him out right before his big day. And I remember saying to him, you know, before he left, I said, Hey, you know what, after you get married, come back, drop a, you know, drop a photo off. We'd love to see, love to see it and love to see how your day went. And he came in two weeks ago and he, for the life of me, I mean, I wouldn't remember you know, where we were if I was a patient, but he came by and he dropped off the picture and, you know, he and his wife are so happy, but that's, that's what, that's why we keep doing this is, you know, to help people. Right. Exactly. I, in, in fact, I, when you were telling me this, um, I actually came across a photo not too long ago that was taken, oh, 40 years ago uh, on some ceramics. I had done a a uh, full upper restoration on a young lady that had diastemas, um, almost every tooth. And um, she would talk with her hand over her mouth and we closed everything up. And she, and when I was there at delivery, she broke down in tears. It was unbelievable. The change that we made in her, I made in her life. I, I that's, yeah. I think when I was fully impacted about what I do for a living, it was, uh, uh, it just, 
And I still have the photo. I have the finished photo of her. And I came across it. And I go, oh, I remember this girl. And I love yeah, it. it was about yeah. 40 years ago. I guess I did it. But uh, well, that wasn't just that wasn't just a life changing moment for her. Oh, it sounds like it was a life changing moment for you oh, as well. Absolutely. It was because up to that point, you know, I was kind of I won't say young and dumb, but I was young and, and you know, I, I just said, well, I'm going to work. And it was a job. It was just a job. But that after seeing that and being there in the in the operatory with with the doctor when it was delivered was that was it was just it was inspiring for me. And that's what changed, I think, uh, my attitude about the what I do for a living, you know, and, and that's why I continue doing it. I love it. I love the results. And and I hear it from the doctors that we work for here. And, you know, and now with uh, what we do on all on fours and, and, and all on sixes and the life changes on these people that have like had dentures for years that couldn't keep them in their mouth and so on and so forth. And, you know, we're doing a lot with uh, locator attachments where, you know, they have really no residual ridge whatsoever. And they'll put in a couple of implants and and uh, they give them a denture and it just snaps in place and they're able to eat. Uh, they don't have to worry about, you know. The- and those and those are tremendously cost effective. Oh, yes. Yes. You know, solutions to a pretty big problem. To a large problem, especially people probably back then had did not have the the knowledge or or the money to go in and have their dental care taken care of and had periodontal disease and and bone resorbed to the point. And then they put dentures in and resorb more and you end up with no ridges. And consequently, you know, they have dentures that are flopping around the mouth or you could, you could tell, or they click or, but now you put in a couple of implants and, and, you know, you can put locator attachments on those if you wish. And patient doesn't have to worry about the embarrassing moments that they had at maybe at dinner or with the family. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's got it's gone quite a ways in the last fifty seven years that you mentioned it. Now I didn't realize <laughs> I was a lab technician that long. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wonderful service to our country. Oh. And Welcome. thank you for being such a wonderful mentor to all of us here in the lab. And I'm, I'm proud to, to know you and I'm proud to call you one of my mentors. So thank you for all you've done here for to everybody here at Keating Dental Lab. Well, thank you. Okay, Jim, be well. Right. Thank uh, you. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the Dental Up podcast, your daily source for insights from dentists and leaders in the industry. This episode is sponsored by Keating Dental Lab here to add value to your dental practice. With high quality restorations, friendly, reliable service, the best products and prices, come experience the Keating difference. Visit KeatingDentalLab.com for details.